Good morning, August 14, 2022, at the First United Church of Christ in Richmond, Michigan, with the very dedicated Pastor Katie Daly presiding. And today's sermon is having faith, even when you're in the pits. So this ought to be a very good sermon today. I think I can relate to that, and uh, I think we all can. But please, come to church. If we don't see you in church, thank you for tuning in online. God bless. As we gather as a Kaya church, come as you are church. And it matters not how your journey of faith has been up until now. We're just glad you're with us. And we hope that anything that is said, if something says that tickles your heart, we're glad. It's all we want. And if it's in any way made you closer to God, if you want to join and give to our church and our mission activities, you are certainly welcome to do that. But remember, your journey of faith does not matter. Wherever you are on your journey, you are welcome to be here with us. And yes, we are a Kaya church. So now for the ringing of the bell. the lighting of the candle. Those of you at home, I hope you have a candle to light in your worship space. As a reminder that Jesus is the light of the world and we are God's light in the world. I want you to pause right this minute for thinking about fire and the stories about fire that are in the scriptures. Pastor, mm -hmm. I have a special tune I'd like to play. Okay. A celebration oh. of somebody. Okay, go right ahead. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Jack Gannon just had a birthday. Why don't we get one? <laughs> to answer to you. <laughs> so now for our call to worship. We are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us lay down the waste and sin that to us. Let us run the race that is set before us. Let us look to Jesus Christ, the protector of our faith. He endured the cross for our sakes and now sits at the right hand of God. Let us worship the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And I forgot to remind everybody to thank them. Um, so many of our school supplies have already come in. We've already taken a basket full over, and any other supplies that are coming in, we are so grateful. And I want you to know, too, that it's mentioned on our Facebook page that Lutheran, Trinity Lutheran, will again be hosting McRest, but of course during COVID and the whole change, it's been done a little bit differently. But there is a link on there that if you want to volunteer in any capacity for McRest, which is the Macomb County Revolving Emergency Shelter Team, you can volunteer in any capacity if you like. So please stand for our August song.
together a prayer of confession. Loving God, you are so powerful to us. You created us, you nurture us, you protect and guide us, and you want what is best for us. But we reject your tender care of us and seek in our own paths. Instead of fruit of the Spirit, like love and joy and peace, our hearts produce greed, selfishness, and pride. Forgive us for turning away from you. Forgive us for forgetting who we are and whose we are. Show us how to produce good fruit that is pleasing in your sight. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. God's love is sure and steadfast. Receive the good news that you are forgiven and return to right relationship with God. Amen. And our prayer for illumination together. Open our ears and humble our hearts as we approach your word. Bread and plain today, pray God. We may we listen, discern, and follow the path you intend for us. Amen. Can I invite Kim to come forward this time? Good morning. Good morning. Our first reading is from the book of the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 38, verses 4 through 6 and 8 through 10. In those days, the prince, princes of the king, Jeremiah, ought to be put to death. He is demoralizing the soldiers who are left in the city and all the people by speaking such things to them. He is not interested in the welfare of our people but in their ruin. King Zechariah answered, He is in your power, and the king could do nothing with them. And so they took Jeremiah and threw him into a cistern of the prince Melchiah, which was in the quarters of the guard, letting him down the road, leading him down the ropes, there was no water in the cistern, only mud, and Jeremiah sank into the mud. Even when he got a court official, went out to the place and said to him, My Lord King, these men have been at fault, and all they have done to the prophet Jeremiah, casting him into a cistern. He will die of famine on the spot, and there will be no more food in the city. Then the king ordered Eveliah the Cushite to take three men along with him and draw the prophet Jeremiah out of the cistern before he should die. Our second reading is from a letter to the Hebrews, chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. Brothers and sisters, since we Surrounded, we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us rid ourselves of every burden and sin that clings to us and preserve in the running and running the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the leader and the perfecter of faith. For the sake of the joy that lie before him, he endured the cross despising its shame, and has taken his seat at the right of the throne of God. Consider how he endured such opposition from sinners in order to make you grow, not grow weary and lose heart. In your struggle against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood.
And you need to remain seated for this gospel reading, please, it's a tough one. Reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke, chapter 12, verses 49 to 53. Jesus said to his disciples, I have come to set the earth on fire, and how I wish it were already blazing. There is a baptism with which I must be baptized, and how great is my anguish until it is accomplished. Do you think that I have come to establish peace on the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, a household of five will be divided. Three against two, and two against three. The father will be divided against his son, and a son against his father, and a mother against her daughter, and a daughter against her mother mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And this is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Between that first reading and the gospel reading, you have to say, what's it all about? And is Jesus crazy for making this kind of prediction? So I thought I'd start with a story. I heard this quite a few years ago from Pastor Jim Perfota. Two cars were waiting at a stoplight. The light turned green, but the man didn't notice it. The woman in the car behind him Watching traffic pass by them was getting angry. The woman begins pounding on her steering wheel and yelling at the man to move. That man doesn't move. And the woman is going ballistic inside her car, ranting and raving at the man, pounding on her steering wheel and the dashboard, and the light turns yellow. The woman then begins to blow the car horn and screams at the man. The man, hearing the commotion, looks up, sees the yellow light, and accelerates through the intersection just as the light turned red. The woman is beside herself, screaming in frustration as she misses her chance to get through the intersection. And as she is still mid-rant, she hears a tap, tap, tap on her window, looks up, and she sees the barrel of a gun held by a very serious-looking police officer. The police officer tells her, shut off your car while keeping both hands in sight. She complies at what is happening, and after she shuts off the engine, the police officer orders her to exit her car with her hands up. She gets out of the car, and he orders her to turn and placed her hands on the hood of the car. As she does that, he then says, put your hands behind you. She is quickly cuffed and hustled into the patrol car. She is too bewildered by the chain of events to even ask any questions and is driven to the police station where she is fingerprinted, photographed, searched, booked, and placed in a cell. After a couple of hours, a police officer approaches the cell and opens the door for her. She is escorted back to the booking desk where the original officer is waiting with her personal things. He hands her the bag containing her things and says, I'm really sorry for this mistake, but you see, I pulled up behind your car while you were blowing your horn and screaming a blue streak at the car in front of you, and then I noticed the choose life license plate holder, 
Though, what would Jesus do in the Follow Me to Sunday School bumper stickers? And the chrome plated Christian fish emblem on the trunk. So naturally, I assumed you had stolen the car. <laughs> so we say that what happens in that story is that all of what she wanted to present on her car was not evidenced in her actions. Sometimes that's how we are. We say a lot of things, or we might try to present a lot of things, but the reality is that's not really where our heart is. And I don't know about you, but in my prayer life, you know what? My best times of prayer are really when I'm stuck in a traffic light. Because I just sit there, and I'd be guilty. I'd be the one car in front because I just sit there and say, okay, God, what do you want for today? I'm trying to listen. And sometimes my eyes are shut. And if I'm not praying in the car, I'm praying in the shower. So those are my go-to places to really pray. And I'm thinking of this lady, and I'm thinking, well, okay. What did all of that stuff on her car actually mean? And when you see things flying in the breeze, what do they actually mean? Because actions really do speak louder than words. And so in that first reading, good old Jeremiah, he was no dummy, you know. When God called him to ministry, he said, Oh, hey, no way, God. I don't want anything to do with this stuff. I'm too young. I have no experience. And the way the world is today, I just don't really want to be speaking truth to the people here today. And it was a world that was tipsy-turvy, like our world is today. And you know what it's like when you speak truth to a situation and people don't want to hear you. They don't want to hear truth. They're going to back you against the wall or they're going to get throwing you in a pit or out the door. And I know it's evidenced in some of the things that I've said because I know there have been times when people have said, do you have to speak about forgiveness all the time? Can't you get off it? And you know what? That's what Jesus spoke about all the time. And when you look at our world today, what is wrong with our world today? We don't talk to each other. We talk at each other. And we're thinking about what our next words are going to be because we want to be the one that has the last word. But we sometimes don't listen to the other side. And we know that that's what needs to happen. And when you think of fire, when I asked you to think about fire in the scriptures, was there a story that came right like that to your mind about fire? Anybody? Moses. Moses and the burning bush, of course. What did that fire indicate? The presence of God. Okay. And so anytime the fire was, and then when the fire shows up in the Christian scriptures, we have the tongues of fire that are described as falling upon the disciples. And that's to show the presence of God, the presence of the Spirit. And the Jesus in the Gospel reading is saying, I came to cause the fire. This is one reading I could... Jack, close your ears. I remember one time when this was being spoken at our church. And because of the, I'm going to pit mother against daughter, da 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 he got so mad and he got up and walked out. And the pastor at the time, I don't even remember how he got into his sermon, but he basically was pretty much repeating what the reading was. And I just sat there because I was like, oh, I'm so embarrassed. He just walked right out, you know. But yes, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He's already been preaching to everybody for so long. He, and they love him. They love him when he's doing all the nice things. Healing the sick, touching the poor, being very good and kind. But whoa, when all of a sudden he gets mad and says, I really came to set you guys on fire. And that's what pastors need to do. Set people on fire. Because sometimes it's so easy to just sit at the wooden pew, come for an hour on Sunday, walk out the door and 
Do nothing. Do nothing for your neighbor. Not go and visit somebody. Not drop a snail mail to anybody. Not follow a request if somebody's asked you for somebody's address. And sometimes we are really negligent because we call ourselves Christian. And you know what? If we were really, really, really following Jesus, we would be on fire for Jesus. We would not sit back and say, oh, it's not cool to talk to your grandchildren about God or faith or church. But we sit back and say, oh, we don't do that today. And God forbid we talk about a morality in life's situations because we're not on fire enough to say, you know what, I'm not going to support you in this relationship. We don't know what the commandments are. How about you try following them once in a while? Don't expect me to be coming and supporting you when you're not even living up to God's law. Do we do that? We don't want to ruffle the feathers, do we? We're cowards in so many ways. God wants to set us on fire. If only we could be set on fire for the Lord. When we're set on fire, when things are going on in family relationships and issues, you reach out and touch. No matter how many times someone's going to just turn their face or give you a hug kind of answer when you say hello. Or look down at you like, how dare you come here? You try and try and try again. That's what Jesus means when he says, I want to set it on fire. And sometimes I think maybe I haven't been strong enough because I haven't been thrown out yet. I feel like I'm still on solid ground that nobody has um, pushed me out the door. But maybe you're ready to now. Because sometimes truth has to be spoken about politics, about life, even though people say, I come to church to feel good. I come to church to feel good. But how about if you feel good because you're following Christ and you're really on fire for Christ? You know, there are a lot of things in this world that do need to be broken. There are systems of injustice. There are tired and old traditions that are not working for us anymore. And there are certainly unhealthy patterns of living and cycles of despair. Plenty of things in this world need to be broken. We know change is very hard, and it's not easy. But we are called to change what needs to be changed in our world and in our church and in our own hearts. The divisions over Jesus' message reach even into the inner recesses of the home, and it does pit family members against one another. It's really happened at this time in our society. There are certain topics that you can't even bring up when you're in the home with other family members. Like King Zedekiah, who listened first to one set of the officials and then to a servant with differing interpretations, he learned what the gospel demands, what is really needed in the world. So it's easy to reject the vision of a prophet because they want transformative change. And somebody who's very prophetic, like Martin Luther King Jr., who just would not stop, would not stop, would not stop. And it was the same thing with Mother Teresa. We think of her as that nice little old lady doing her thing. And you know, even in her life, at the end of her life, she kept a journal. And she even questioned, she said, am I really doing what God wants me to do? And she was doing so much good for all of the poor people in Calcutta. So Christians, all of us, we are confronted with different interpretations of the gospel as we read it. 
And you know, we read it first and we take it very literally. And then when we meditate it on it a little bit more, we start to see a little bit more in those readings and start to come to a new understanding. And yes, even as we grow older, there's going to be times when we say, I read the Bible and I just don't get it. And it's true. It's true with a lot of us. Because sometimes you have to go into the historical background of the reading. Jeremiah was basically saying to the people, don't be fighting these Babylonians, just give up, give in to them. And they didn't want to hear that. That would be like us going over to Ukraine and saying, you know, just give in to Russia. I don't think any of us would want them to do that. But that was what he was saying to the people at the time. And Jesus was basically saying, I came to start a fire in your heart. So sometimes in a family, there's a need for intervention. I don't know if you've ever been part of an intervention. I think probably a couple of you have been. It is ugly at first. Because there could be somebody in the family who's strung out on drugs or alcohol all the time and you see what's happening to them and their children and it's time to confront the issue. And when you do, when you do, they don't look at you and go, oh, thank you so much for telling me the truth. They're like, that's not true. I don't want to hear it. Don't be telling me about what I like and what I'm doing with my life. They fight you tooth and nail, but you go ahead and you keep on doing it. Why? Because you love them. And that's the same thing with God. Sometimes we are put into some situation that feels so uncomfortable. And we know that God is putting us in the fire to refine us a little bit. Because maybe there's something a little bit wrong with our hearts. Jesus was on his way to the cross. Up the hill, for the cross, not a coronation. <clears throat> so he was at the point in his life where he was saying, if I don't get these people to finally understand, they're never going to get the message. I have to be tough. You know, for a while back there, he always called it tough love. So Jesus is no longer trying to push in everything and just be Mr. Nice Guy. He's saying it as it is. I came, I tried to set you on fire for God. And somehow, you're missing the boat. What am I doing wrong that you're not responding? And you know, for any preacher, if you never have somebody who disagrees with you and says, I've had enough of you, you know what? If you're just cozy, nice, and just comfortable all the time, you're not doing your job. You're really not doing your job. You're just creating a, oh, it's a wonderful, it's a wonderful world in this neighborhood. And I don't want to see anything bad. But that's not what Jesus wants. Because every single one of us, we've got a crack in our heart. And that crack is there to let the light of God shine through. And it's in the brokenness of times that we learn the most. You may remember something of a preacher who does nothing but say everything's wonderful and perfect and just everybody loves everybody else. That's not true. We know that's not true. If you don't rattle the cage of somebody some of the time, you're not doing your job as a minister. And re reaching that point where it's tough love, or it's time to have intervention, is really tough. And I remember back uh, Leonard Cohen saying a song. Oh, actually, I remember hearing it here, too, at uh, Denise's. I think it was when Denise, Pastor Denise was moving on to the Corktown Church. Leonard Cohen does a song about the crack and how we all have cracks. To let the light show. So Jesus came to destroy the fake 
peace. And to incite all of us to the gospel message. You know, to fight hunger, to fight poverty, to fight prejudice, to fight ageism, and all the other isms of the world. Jesus came to actually break our hearts because our hearts are sometimes hard. He came to break our hard hearts so that the light could shine through. You know, in that song, Leonard Cohen says, Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. So those who embark on Jesus' way, however, are empowered as baptism brings forth joy and an introduction to a difficult lifetime and lifelong burning away of anything that stands in the way of us and God and the gospel. Inflamed with that power of the Holy Spirit, we Christians are empowered to continue his mission of healing divisions as diverse hearts and minds are fused into one in the furnace of Christ's love. If only we are willing. And the people said, Amen. Now we're going to have a meditation song.
eternal God, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to the earth to teach us, to love us, to guide us. We come before you today knowing that you hear us when we call to you. If you want, you can read along with me. We lift up to you our broken world and nation. So often we look around. And our invitation to give is always extended to anybody who feels blessed by this ministry. Because from everyone to whom much has been given, much will be required. We present our pledges and our offerings to God. In our prayer of dedication, the bounty of the is upon us. God's table is filled feast beyond our wildest dreams. We are we grateful, grateful to be God's welcome guests. May the May gifts, gifts we give during this offering bless all of others and so we can be blessed. Amen. During this time of worship, we have known forgiveness, restoration, and grace. Now we are sent from this place to share and to serve. May God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer go with us, guiding and blessing us as we seek to be a blessing to others. Amen. Please stand. For the world <laughs>
week when our service has ended, let the service begin. Amen.